Hi everyone, I'm Marissa Frosch from Amphibian Press, and today I'm here with Cassie Danridge Selick. I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your name before we started. <laughs> um, and she's the author of the best selling book, The Pecan Man. And uh, we'll talk about that one first. So, hi Cassie. Hey Marissa. Um, I'm so excited to have you on here. Uh, I just read the description for Pecan Man, and it sounds like a really important book. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, um, it has um, been a real journey for me, um, both in writing the novel and um, and having it be so successful. Um, I grew up in a... Um, time of great change in the country. Um, I was in fifth grade before the first African-American child came to our school. So that sort of theme has always been um, prevalent in my life, this recognition of the disparity um, between people of color and, and whites in America. And so as I started the novel, I I didn't really have a plan in mind or an agenda, but those themes sort of inserted themselves. And so it, I think it has just really connected with, um, especially my age group who went through this time of a, a time when many whites had maids in their home, housekeepers of color in their home. And this, this sort of um, evolution of learning that our perspective is different than theirs. And when you see something through someone else's eyes, suddenly your perspective changes. And so that was the sort of the theme of the Pecan Man um, without getting into the details of the story yet. Um, so in the story, um, you have a, a white woman and she's single. The, do you go into how she ends up being single or like, I don't yes. know if the, did the yes. husband leave? Or? And, and when I started writing the story, I had, um, I had just seen this old man riding a bicycle. And so I live in the country and I, um, and we have long drives to get to anything. Our County has no fast food, no Walmarts, no anything. So long drive. So I had my little wheels were spinning and I knew when I got home and when I sat down to write the first of the story, it was going to be an elderly white woman, woman telling the story in traditional storytelling fashion, sitting on her front porch, telling this story about why the pecan man who was a homeless black man, she hired to mow her lawn why he died in prison. I didn't know any of the details when I started writing it, but I knew that that would be it and she would be telling the story. And she is a widow, she is a recent widow. And um, what, what, because she was from an era where the woman, college degree or not, was her husband's helpmate. Um, this sort of re suddenly being widowed with no children changed her. It was a paradigm shift for her. She started doing things for herself. She had always done the right thing, the right way in the South to make her husband successful. Mm -hmm. And suddenly she made her own decisions. There was no one guiding those decisions. And so when this horrible thing happens to her maid's daughter, suddenly she's making decisions on her own based on these people that she loves. So yes, she was widowed and, and that is discussed a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, cause I was wondering why she decided to tell the story, I guess, because it says 25 years after the fact. And I wondered why it took her so long to get there, but I wasn't even thinking you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because now things are so different that you forget how different a woman's role was, especially in a marriage back then. Yes. So how was that exploring that, like her, I guess, almost her freedom? Yes. And her evolution. Yeah. Um, her personal evolution and her personal um, self-awareness and growth. Um, because she was sort of 
hemmed in by these social expectations. It wasn't that she had, and, and this, was, this was true of a lot of whites. And we see a whole lot of, in a lot of the stories, like the help and, and those kinds of things, we see a whole lot of white people just behaving badly, you know, oppressive. Yeah. It's a different kind of racism. There's a kind of raci racism by well-intended people who just don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of where she was. Um, but with her, what I wanted to show and what I wanted to see was when she knew better, she did better. And when things became apparent to her, when she learned, she would try to make changes. She had no one else telling her she couldn't. So really to get back to your question of why it took her so long, there's a part in there that I can't talk about too much because it's such a giveaway. I mean, there's a, it's a spoiler. Um, but really we know from the very beginning that Eddie dies in prison. So we know that right away. That's not a spoiler. That's, you learn that right in the beginning. She's telling you, I'm telling you this story now. And, and, it has taken her that long because she made promises to people that she had, she made promises to people that she loved. And she's at a point now where she feels like she's been released from those promises. And she's going to not just set the record straight about Eddie, not just clear his name, but tell who he was because the neighborhood had, and the townspeople had given him this name the pecan man, because he was just this old man who rode around with pecans, uh, you know, hanging from his bike. And so this, the pecan man sort of took away who he was and made him this sinister figure who had, you know, committed this murder in town, which um, we, we, know, I mean, we know from the beginning that he was innocent. So we know that it's the, the details going through, um, one of the things I sort of try to avoid a little bit of, but anyway, um, it's that uh, she wanted to wanted to tell people who he was, and now she felt free to. Um, so, you said you got the idea when you were driving. Um, like, how did it? Did you end up with, I guess, an outline or did it just kind of flow? Is it one of those ones that just kind of took off? Well, I never outline. <laughs> I, well, I, I don't, I, I do outline after I get started, but it's not an outline outline. I sort of timeline to keep things straight, to keep details straight. Um, but in this case, I was not, you know, I, I'd been a writer. I, my second grade teacher told me I was a writer. But the world told me coming up, you can't make a living as a writer. Mm -hmm. The world told me you have to do this and you have to do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. And so I grew up and raised children and, and sort of went along with it. But I always wrote. But I was at a point in my life where we had, I had quit a lucrative job with Merrill Lynch. I was about to get my own office as a manager, um, as an operations manager, and I just, one day just said, I, I don't want to do this. This is not who I am. It's not who I want to be. I'm a writer. I want to be a writer. And so we moved to North Florida and this was my thing. I was supposed to be writing, but I was still raising a daughter. So on my way back from the grocery store, I passed this old man. He was riding a bicycle. He just sort of pulled out of the woods and I sort of followed him a minute until it was a little creepy to be following him anymore. But my little rider wheels are spinning. I go around another corner and there's another man picking up pecans. And then I just thought about it on the way home. And so I write in my head more than ever makes it to paper. Mm -hmm. All writers do. But this time when I got home, I knew three things. I knew three characters, Orly Beckworth, who was the narrator, Blanche, who was her housekeeper, and Eddie, who was the pecan man. And I went home and I wrote the first chapter or two. And that's all I really did write at first. And then I wrote a little bit more and then I put it away. And over the next 10 years, I kept, the, the characters kept pulling me back. Mm -hmm. And then I got involved with the writers group. 
and started having sort of deadlines. Like a, I would write a chapter a week and I would, you know, and go to my writer's group, which is an hour and a half away. And so those kinds of things kept me going on the story, but it was always, um, for the most part with this one, it was completely character driven. I write using what I call mind movies. And so I just see the action and transcribe what's happening. So there's very little narrative description other than what I want you to see. And I did that and it was hard and I don't recommend doing that. Um, I've, I've gotten to where I, I outline a little more now, but I really feel like I have to think about who the characters are and I have to let them live and breathe. And I have to sometimes let them decide what's happening. And that's really how I function. Um, so you published The Pecan Man in 2012. Yes. And there's a sequel, The Truth About Grace. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I never intended to write a sequel. Um, but as I went along, it took, you know, it took a year or two for Pecan Man to really take off. <coughs> But once it did, I started, you know, I started getting letters and book clubs and things picking it up and a lot of discussion about what, what happened to Grace. Um, and I started realizing how much it paralleled or was somewhat inspired by events in my life. Um, I had a sister who was a drug addict. Um, she suffered a childhood trauma that was never really addressed. And, and she was a drug addict her entire life. And so I published in 2012. In 2015, my sister died of a drug overdose. And the more we talked about it with book clubs, the, and the more I heard from people, listen, we need to know if Grace is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And this was the, the burning question was the character Grace, the little girl who was raped as a child. Is she going to be okay? And I kept answering them. I don't know. In my family, at this point now, I have lost four people to drug overdoses. Four immediate family members. And I was not raised in a family that was, you know, uh, we were decidedly middle-class, educated people. Um, I've lost a nephew, sister, niece, and now a stepdaughter um, just recently, a week or so ago. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi. You know, it has been just a, it is such an epidemic now. It is so prevalent that I, there is not a book club I talk to who doesn't have someone in there he says, I'm going through this too. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the more I speak about it, the more I need to speak about it. And so I just challenged myself, go there. But I kept saying, I don't know recovery. I only know addiction. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I started reading books about recovery. I had an idea for what I wanted to do, for what I wanted to do with the house. And then in reading some of those books, one of them pointed me to Al-Anon, which is the 12-step the program for families of addicts or, or alcoholics. <laughs> and I started attending and I started learning more about what, what recovery might look like. Mm -hmm. Not lucky. Um, because I wanted there to be some hope for grace. And so I started writing The Truth About Grace, and I, as I, the, the more I went, the harder it got, because there were so many parallels to, um, to what happened within my family and the dynamic between the sisters. Grace, Grace had an older sister, Patrice, and there was this dynamic of, you know, you have this family member who's just creating havoc in the family. Mm -hmm. And just making a real mess, but everybody loves her. And you're the one who cleans up all the messes. And so that was how the truth about grace came to be. Um, 
Aura sits down to tell at the end of the PK man to tell the, the girls, look, you've been lied to all your life. This is the truth about what happened. Now let's work on fixing this. Let's work on healing. And so that's what I wrote. It, it is definitely really important to talk about um, addiction. Uh, I have a family member who was lucky enough to recover and she had a, an incident recently where she was offered her drug of choice and she said no. And I was so proud of her. So, um, hard to do. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those things that if you can get out of it, it's, it's unfortunately not uncommon to fall back in. Right. So, um, yeah, I was really proud of her and it is really important to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I've gotten to a point in my life, I think this is, it may be my age. I'm turning 60 this month. I'm starting a new decade. Um, it's really important to just reject shame. Yeah. You, you just reject it because it doesn't do you any good. And, and I think my mom really took on this, this mantle of, I can't tell anybody about what's going on because I don't want anybody to know. Mm -hmm. My daughter has, has sunk this far. And what happened with that was when my sister died, my mom just started going downhill and she died four months later with no terminal diagnosis. She just stopped living. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for me. That was another reason it was difficult to write the sequel because my mom was the voice of Aura. She was the voice I heard in my he head of this strong Southern woman that was sort of irreverent and, but always tried to do the right things, but was really irreverent in, in the way she interacted with people. And there, was, there were times when she was just such a genteel lady and other times when she would just say something that you would just die laughing or, or just of embarrassment because it was just so inappropriate. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I just, so I got that voice from my mom. So that was hard. It was hard losing her. It was hard going through all of this. But what's good for me is that I was able to put that into writing that means something to people. Mm -hmm. And so I go through my world now interacting with people that I feel a connection to. And it's been an amazing journey. It really has. I, I never would have imagined, you know, people think about, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you, you know, or, you know, do you want to be a writer? Even when you're thinking about being a writer, you know, what is that like? What is a writer's life like? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't have imagined it would be like this. I couldn't. So, um, <coughs> so you did write, um, one another book which is a little bit lighter um what matters in mayhew yes do you want to tell us a little bit about that yeah <laughs> i may be tarred and feathered and run out of my county i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when i wrote the peak here man i said it in my hometown of leesburg florida i called it a different name but i said it in leesburg so I used the settings, but they weren't real characters. So I did the same thing with this book, What Matters in Mayhew, except that I used the town in which I live now, which is Mayo, Florida, M-A-Y-O. And it's, it's Mayo's in a, in a county of 8,000 people. There's one stoplight in the whole county. <coughs> That's how small. And um, so I used landmarks but i also used a thing i was inspired by there's in in, in one of the main in, in one of the cafes in May, the mayo cafe downtown there's a round table where all the locals sit and for me because i have a real theater background my whole family has a theater background and i saw that as this like greek chorus type character and so i used that in the book and I don't know any of the people at the, that sit at the table, but in writing the book, I, I really, I'm, I'm a real fan of Jan Karen and um, Philip Gully and Fanny Flagg 
and um, and Anne B. Ross, these small town quirky characters, things get out of hand, it's almost a farce. Well, apparently I got things a little too close. <laughs> so I was in I was in the Mayo Cafe the other day and one of the little ladies at the table stopped me. She said, I read your book and I didn't like it one bit. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so it really is meant to be. I mean, the, the main character, and, it, and it's supposed to be the first in the series. I'm working on the second in the series. I had this idea of this character, Beanie Bradshaw, who is a um, inspired by another character I used to see when I was a child who rode a bicycle. But she always had on these like day 11s type uh, outfits. And so I just sort of amped that up into almost a caricature. And Beanie Bradshaw is a girl who doesn't drive a car. She only rides a bike. She makes all of her own clothing and it's all matching the boots, the, the, the dress with the crinolines and that, and the hat, they all match, they're all the same color. And, and she has different outfits. And so she just, and she's a quirky character, but then there's a whole lot of other characters, which is hard for some readers. And I say, you live in it all day long. You, you, you encounter different characters and you know different people. And, and um, so it's okay for there to be a lot of them. And that was what I was exploring. How can you have a story where everybody's threads sort of intertwine at some point, but you have this story over here and, and sweet Lee Atwater and her husband, and he wants to build her a house as a surprise for Christmas because he's won the lottery and he wasn't supposed to be playing lottery. And so in order to keep himself out of trouble, cause he won, and now she's going to know he's going to surprise her with the house and say, well, I won it with the lottery. <laughs> so you can't be mad at me. And I'm like, who would do that? <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I try to do with the book. So anyway, but apparently <laughs> some, some people don't like it. And I said to her when I was walking out the door, I said, am I going to be tarred and feather and run out of town? And she said, no, honey, we don't have that well anymore. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't write fiction. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Um. So you said you're working on the second one. Does that focus around a new set of characters or like something else? Same characters and, and just different ones prominently. But the second one, I, I did go into the same, some of the same themes. So there's a little bit that's, um, you know, serious things like an interracial relationship. Beanie's dating a black man in the first thing. And how's the town going to take that? And, um, in the second one, it's um, tentatively called the Mayhew Junction because the town is called Mayhew Junction, the Mayhew Junction Historical Society. And I'm taking on some, a couple of things, spousal abuse um, and Confederate monuments, the current events. Mm -hmm. But in, within this concept of some of the characters are just, they just don't know any better. And they're, you know, they're just so stuck in these um, really racist behaviors. Um, and yet there are other people who, who are willing to confront them. So I see, what, I'm exploring what it looks like when you have people who are emboldened, like today, like we, we're seeing in America today, where some people who had figured out it's best to just keep all this stuff private. What I say in the kitchen, I'm not actually going to say on the front porch. Well, suddenly they're saying it on loudspeakers, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's where we are today. And, and so I'm sort of exploring those things. And how can, we, how can we see these people interacting with each other and still have a little comedy in it? So, yeah. Um, how far along are you? <clears throat> About two thirds of the way. I am a very slow, <laughs> slow 
uh, writer. What, and, and I actually finished the first novel in my BFA program because the PK man did so well, I was able to quit my full-time job because I had started working full-time again. Um, go back to school and I got a BFA in creative writing from Goddard College in Vermont. And, um, and I finished the novel there. So it was like, I work really well with structure. Mm -hmm. Like if I have a deadline, I'm going to meet it. Um, and so, but I've not been very good at giving myself deadlines. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just sort of trying to, I'm trying to get this one out by September. That's my goal. If I can get this book out by se September, I'll feel like I've, I've done okay. Nice. Um, so you mentioned uh, you do a lot of book clubs. So how can a book club find you and, and what kind of things do you do? Um, if, they're, if they're fairly local in Florida, like I'll go two, two hours. I just went down to Brooksville to attend personally. I like to go personally to some of the book clubs because some of these ladies, I mean, it's just especially in the South, you just have, they, they have these, they'll do a theme. So there's always like pecan pie or, you know, just something to go with the pecan man, because that's the one most people are, are reading and doing for book clubs. But for the most part, I have a website, um, CassieDandridgeSelleck.com. I have a Facebook page for the pecan man. I have a blog for the pecan man. I never expected to to publish more than one book. So everything was, I put under the pecan man. Um, so people have not found it difficult and I make myself accessible. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure I have my email address in my books. Um, I want them to be able to get a hold of me. So if you Google me, you can get almost right immediately to me. And I have on my Facebook page and on my website and on my blog that I'm willing to do. I have places where I have questions for book clubs but also that I'm willing to, to um, do virtual visits and people just contact me every week. I mean, I, I do at least one a week. Um, I also have gone to a couple of classrooms. The novel has done really well in, in high school classrooms um, as a, <clears throat> it's short. The language is not, you know, like To Kill a Mockingbird was my favorite book and it's done a lot in the, um, I just lost my thing. Hang on a second. I've, um, I was I was heavily um, inspired by To Kill a Mockingbird. It's my favorite book growing up, and it's done a lot in in classrooms. But the language has gotten tough to deal with in a classroom setting. So I've had a couple of teachers who have done this, and and I'm I'll work just work with them. And if a teacher does my book in their classroom. If they're, you know, any within a state around, I'll go. Um, I think it's important to have these discussions with teenagers and let them ask questions and let them let them sort of interrogate their own perspective. So, but that's what I've been doing with book clubs as well. It's just doing a virtual visit with them at their meeting when they're discussing the pecan man, and so they can ask me any question they want to and I'll answer it. They can discuss first and see what they say, and then I'll tell them. But for the most part, I'm a writer who says, whatever you, whatever you, your experience is that you bring to this reading, I'm going to say, yeah, you're right. I leave things open enough that they can discuss without me having to say, no, I meant this, or yes, I'm, you know. Mm -hmm. so have these open and frank discussions and they've been real popular because of the subject matter. People are willing to go there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really cool. I like when authors do that. Like we have a, a book club um, through the press. It's just the three of us and we do it on YouTube. Um, but every now and again, cause I always tag the authors when we post the videos and every now and again, one of them will actually like reach out to us and talk to us, which is always exciting. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's for me they keep you know I, they're, they're, the book clubs are so appreciative and I say I'm I'm grateful you're reading my book I have the opportunity if, if you have any idea how amazing it is to sit and listen to people discussing characters you created I'm the one who's grateful and I'm perfectly willing to do it I don't charge for it I just I'm 
I'm willing to rearrange my schedule as much as I can just to be there and talk to them. Um, as I, when I, you know, I say the same thing every time. I'm just a girl who wrote a book. I'm just like you, you know, I'm just like you. And, and so it's like taking that sort of um, fandom thing out, which I don't like the word fan. I don't, I have readers. I don't have fans. I don't, I have people who read my book and share, hear the story with me. So. Um. So I just want to talk about for a minute. So your first two books tackle some pretty serious topics. Um, do you think you're going to return to any serious topics in the future? I think uh, there will likely be these themes throughout all of my novels. Um, I am a very political person. And of course, I try to keep it off my, um, off the, the uh, social media. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, it's on my social media, but I don't, I don't friend people who aren't, you know, part of my, so yeah, social media regarding my novels and, right. and things. Um, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm very much, um, an activist. I, I think there's some things that, you know, like we need to be doing better with healthcare. We need to be doing better with, with people who have these addictions need a way out. Mm -hmm. They need help. There need to be programs for them. Um, um, and, and the thing with race in America, we're not there yet. We need to do better. And, and so these things, you know, are important to me. So they're part of who I am. I really am very vocal about these things. So I don't have an agenda when I sit down to write. I just have my characters encounter real situations. And, and respond to them. So. Um, well, I'm glad because that's kind of my goal too, is to just have them encounter real situations. Um, of course, mine are paranormal, so they also encounter oh. not real situations. <laughs> <laughs> it's all paranormal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I try to put the real situations in there too. Yeah, the human things, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you have a website and everything, just real quick, all the places people can find you online. Um, Cassie Dandridge Selleck.com, uh, the pecan man dot wordpress.com. Um, on Facebook, there is a page for the pecan man. There is a page for Obstinate Daughters Press, which is a hybrid press that my daughters and I, my obstinate daughters and I, are just in the startup phases. And it's mainly to have an imprint for my books and also to help others, so, um, authors self publish. Um, and so, Obstinate Daughters comes from, it's sort of a play on The Optimist's Daughter by Eudora Welty. But um, it's also this, this idea that every gain that women in America or across the world have made in this world that men have taken for granted has come about because someone's obstinate daughter says, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of that theme. So that's on there. Um, and then I also have an author page on Facebook, Cassie Dandridge Selleck author. Um, and I have an author page on Amazon. Awesome. Thank you so much.